you. Welcome to the webinar, Kick Some Glass, 10 Ways Women Succeed at Work on Their Own Terms, presented by Jennifer Martineau of the Center for Creative Leadership and Portia Mount of Ingersoll Rand. My name is Tracy Dobbins, and I'm your CCL event host. If you're just getting to know us, CCL is a top 10 ranked provider of executive education globally. We work with two thirds of the world's top 500 companies, providing innovative solutions for the entire organization and programs proven to transform the individual. CCL has been at the forefront of women's leadership for over 40 years. For some of the earliest research into breaking the glass ceiling and innovative programs designed to empower women leaders around the globe. CCL offers resources and solutions to help with the unique leadership requirements women need across industries, leader levels, and cultures. Before our presenters uh, begin, I again want to reiterate that we love participation and invite you to use the chat tool provided on the right side of your screen. You can ask questions or interact with the presenters. Simply direct your chat to all participants. We will have a formal question and answer session, which will be held at the end of the webinar. And as Regina mentioned, a formal, um, uh, we will send a recorded webinar link to you after the webinar, as including some additional resources. Okay, with all the details behind this, I'd like to welcome our presenters, Jennifer Martineau. Jennifer is a um, Senior Vice President of Research and Evaluation at Style Advancement at the Center for Creative Leadership. And with her is Portia Mount. She's Vice President and Global Leader of Strategic Marketing at Ingersoll Rand. Welcome, Jennifer and Portia. And now I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer. Thank you. So we are so glad to be here with you all today. This is Jennifer Martineau. I uh, want to say a little bit, introduce myself and why, in the, why am I sitting here and talking with you about women's leadership. We'll say a little bit more about why we wrote the book, but to, to start off with, just know that I'm a I am a mom of three adult children. We've been through all of those crazy teenage years and, and all of the divided attention that happens, and now we have a wonderful uh, son-in-law as well. My husband and I have been married 29 years, and I'm an executive leader here at the Center for Creative Leadership who enjoys developing women, and men, of course, too, but particularly women. I love anything to do with the water, the lake, the beach, and wine, of course, is water. And, and my children have turned me from a cat lover to a dog lover. So that's a little bit about me. And let me, uh, let Portia introduce herself. Hi, and welcome to uh, participants around the world. This is Portia Mount, and I'm so delighted to be here with you today. Uh, I too am a working mom of two kids. I actually have been married for 13 years. I'd like to call myself a free-range Californian because I was born and raised in California, but have lived all over the world, uh, and, but currently call North Carolina home. And I am a marketing executive. I spent actually a decade here at the Center for Creative Leadership, so I am deeply in love with this amazing organization. And I'm also incredibly passionate about uh, women's leadership and helping women in particular to really realize their full uh, potential. I am a fitness enthusiast. I am a serious coffee drinker, and uh, if you like to cook, I'm, I'm your person. Uh, I also want to just encourage just very uh, briefly, um, you, um, Jennifer and I are both on social media, and at the end of this presentation, we, uh, would end this, um, we encourage you to please connect with us through LinkedIn or Twitter or Instagram, and you'll also see the handles for CCL as well. There's just a wealth of information there for you. So we look forward to staying, connecting with you here, but also staying connected with you beyond our time together. And we'll share with you too at the end uh, the website uh, where we can have some ongoing conversations with men and women who are interested in helping women advance. Exactly, we love to connect, so please, uh, so please do connect with us. So, so about the book, why are we writing this book? There are lots of books of women's leadership out there in the world. Why did we think that it was time for us to write one? Well, several years ago, uh, when we were uh, experiencing the, the election, uh, potential election of Hillary Clinton, we thought we were gonna see possibly a woman, a woman in, in the White House in the US. We, of course, see women in senior leadership roles in uh, uh, politics around the world. 
And we thought, wow, that's, that's really kind of changing things. I wonder how, what kind of impact that will have. Of course, as leadership geeks, and I'm a research geek, we pay attention to things like that. And so we've, we've watched um, what's been happening in, in uh, the, the public space uh, for so many years, and we thought, uh, we are executives. We are women who have, uh, who, have, who have grown through our careers, starting at early levels and have grown to executive levels. We've, we've had some of those bumps, some of those bruises. We run into some of the barriers that happen. And, um, and we also know that there's a richness of uh, research from CCL. And we decided we wanted to pull that together in a book written for mid-career, mid-level women um, who are facing some of the very challenges that we've faced and try to help them to, to move through those challenges by using their own strengths. And so this session is going to help you do just that. So what we'll cover today is we've divided the book into 10 different chapters. And, um, and so we will, we'll share a snapshot of the lessons that we learned uh, in writing the book. We were so fortunate to interview uh, over 50 men and women leaders and who shared their very deep personal stories. And so we'll give you a little bit of flavor for each one of uh, what, what we learned in each one of those, uh, those lessons. Um, we'll also touch on a lot of the research that we mined. Um, the wonderful thing is there is a deep treasure trove both within CCL and outside of CCL around women and leadership. And so we'll share with you a snapshot of what we've learned there. Most importantly, we want you to come away with ways that you can be part of the solution for helping women um, lead uh, and step into their, into their power, whether you are a leader yourself and you are coaching a team, or perhaps you're, you're, attend, you're listening to our voice and you're thinking about your own career, we hope that you'll walk away with something that you can put to, put to use uh, today. And of course, and most importantly, we want to hear your thoughts and insights again, both in the chat and the time that we have together, but also please contact us um, uh, through our social media handles, also through the web, the kicksomeglass.com website uh, that we'll share with you because we love to keep this discussion going. So let's talk a little bit about where we stand with women in leadership um, and what we have learned. Women have made great strides. There is no denying that. Uh, and in the last decade, we've seen that from 1997 to 2009, Women's share of board seats in the S&P 1500 in companies increased 94%, or about 7.2 percentage points. The share of women in top executive positions increased by about 2.8%, or about 80 uh, two percentage points, or about 86%. And then the share of companies with female CEOs has also increased. So that was a good decade. We saw really <laughs> positive upward, stri upward strides. And yet, as we stand here today, we know there's still work to be done. There are currently fewer women on the boards of the S&P 500 companies than men named John or David. True fact. Um, and what we've seen is, is that while women have made great strides in leadership, globally, the proportion of women in senior roles of organization has been stuck about at the 25%, 24-25% mark in the last decade. In every region of the world, women are less likely than men to be employed full-time. Globally, men are 10 times more likely to be head of government, and women are twice as likely to be denied an education. This is very, this is very serious. And then and we'll talk a little bit more about this towards the end, but we're also seeing that as early as elementary school, fourth grade, Girls are starting to opt out of leadership roles. And so there's work to be done. And then very, very recently, and this, we just, uh, we, we spent a lot of time, of course, scanning uh, scholarly journals and, uh, and uh, news sites. We are seeing for the first time in a very long time that there are fewer women. So the number of women who are leading companies, who are CEOs of companies is actually going, is going down. And so there are a lot of reasons for that, but in this particular this year, for example, we saw Indra Nui, CEO of Pepsi, uh, step down from her role. We've seen very recently the CEO of Campbell Soup step down from her role. And what we're also seeing is that 
those roles are not being replaced. They're not necessarily women in the pipeline to replace them. So we'll talk a little bit about this phenomenon and what we think is going on. Um, but it's it, in the in the first time in a long time we're seeing a downward trend. And and let me speak to one of the questions that we see in the chat here. Yeah. Um, did yeah. how does the growth look for women of color? Um, did we consider it? We actually have considered it. What we did is we wrote we're writing the book there. We, we actually need to write a second book, if you will, um, because when you get into intersectionality, when you look into different um, combinations of, of uh, demographics, then women of color certainly are seeing less growth, more drop off, et cetera, than, uh, than white women are. And of course, that varies around the world, um, depending on majority, major, majority, minority, and power differentials. So we, we, for this webinar, we're keeping it very clean in terms of talking about gender in particular. But yes, it's, that's an important question to ask. So as we think about the pipeline, what we're seeing is this, is that women in general are, uh, ha are represented in corporate America at the entry manager level, men and women, um, at the entry level, I should say, men and women have parity. It's when we start moving into advanced roles, particularly vice president, senior vice president, and C-suite, where we see the pipeline thin out. Equally important is we see fewer women in revenue generating roles, which are, and those are the roles that lead to C-level positions. And so um, across the board, the women are there, but they're falling out of the pipeline as we move into increasingly more senior positions. And again, we'll touch on a little bit about why we think that is, and back to the point of the, the uh, uh, previous person who asked the question about women of color, and that is doubly so for women of color who um, may even have a, a more difficult time moving into senior, uh, senior roles because of um, organizational barriers. And we'll talk about what some of those barriers look like both for women of color and for, um, for all women. Okay. So, most of you on the line, men and women who are on the line, I'm sure get the business case. You get why it's important to have access to half of an organization's talent um, as it moves up through an organization. You don't want to see the pipeline uh, thinning out like that because think of all the talented people who you're losing as you're moving up through uh, senior levels of organizations. We're just gonna share one piece of data here. There is a good bit of data about the financial uh, uh, benefits that come uh, from having more women on boards and women in senior leadership. Um, but for, for particular, um, one of the pieces of research that CCL has done, we wanted to get, to get in a little bit more into what's driving people as employees and learn that both men and women who have female bosses also report that they have more career support, they feel more organizational commitment to their organization, they feel more engagement, and they have less burnout. There's a lot underneath that that we could unpack in another webinar, but right now, just to say, when you have more women in a workforce, your workforce as a whole is more engaged and feeling more connected to their work. That's a real positive thing to have happen. So with all of that as backdrop, Portia and I, as we said, started out thinking, let's write this book, and let's write it not to fix the woman. There's nothing wrong with women. Make this clear here. This is about, yeah, there are barriers that stand in front of us, and they stood in front of Portia and I. How do we recognize those barriers and not assume that it's about us personally, recognize them as real barriers, and then, um, and then use the strengths that we have to, to get over them, to get past them, to seek the help that we need? And so that's the framing that we took with the book. Now we're gonna dive into the chapters and um, we're gonna share just a few minutes on each of the 10 chapters to give you just enough of a taste that it makes you wanna buy the book, shameless, pub, uh, 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 shameless plug. promotion, plug. And um, see, I don't even know how to do that. Anyway, um, <laughs> shameless plug, uh, because every chapter has exercises and has ways in which you can think about yourself and reflect and then move forward. So living your intention is the first important step. We, we want you to, to take a few minutes and, um, and, and think about what you, are, um, 
what it is you're wanting to do. What do you want to live for? What's important to you? The first step along any path is to figure out where you want to go. You may know exactly how you want your life to be in five to ten years, and if you do, you can talk with people who are living that life, and you can find out how they got there. What decisions do you need to make to set your course to get there? But, you know, whether or not we know where we want to go, those forces that get in our way that prevent us from living in our, our intention are real. And let's talk about a few of those. One is personal expectations. Um, when you think of leadership roles, do you see yourself in a leadership role? Do you see leadership as something that you'd be good at? If not, you may be limiting your future by, uh, by backing off and thinking that um, that's not for me. You know, that's for somebody else. That role is not for me. And so how do you move past unintentionally blocking your own path uh, and move forward? Another thing that gets in the way is others' expectations. Now, whether your parents expect you to live your life in your mother's image or your partner expects you to manage the majority of the, the homekeeping tasks, because we know that's still true for many working women, or your boss expects you to remain 100% focused on your career, others' expectations can have an impact on the kind of decisions that you make and that prevent you from living your intention. In terms of organizational practices, some of our research uh, colleagues did a study with the network of executive women, and it was focused on barriers that women encounter in the workforce. One of those barriers is being overlooked and undervalued. Women in the study reported that they're not groomed for leadership positions to the same extent as they see their male colleagues being groomed. They're often excluded from important business conversations, they're told they aren't ready for additional responsibility, and they don't feel properly acknowledged for their work or their contributions. So think about whether those organizational practices might be something getting in your way. Finally, another facet that gets in the way is cultural beliefs and practices, and this can vary by uh, culture anywhere you are in the world. A culture's expectations for women in the workplace uh, can hold you back. So how many of you heard when you were younger, why would a nice girl like you want to be you know, a scientist or an engineer? Don't you want to do something like, you know, something more feminine? Or have you been told that field, uh, field roles or revenue generating roles aren't really appropriate for women? One of the women we interviewed in the book is a scientist in Saudi Arabia, and she wanted to be a doctor when she was younger, but because her training would require her to be alone with men in hospitals, culture wouldn't allow it then. So she became a scientist instead, and frankly, she's quite a good one but it did limit her from seeking what she wanted to do. So we're gonna keep moving, but I encourage you to reflect on these questions after the webinar. Where do you wanna be in five to 10 years? What's gotten in your way? And what can you do to get back on track with that direction you want to move into? So reflecting on the women that we talked to, uh, a common theme was that they all had a deep sense of purpose and tension, what Jennifer just talked about, and it was also guided by a deep sense of agency. And the term agency was coined by psychologist David Backen, who described it as the human desire to control one's life, to excel. Agency is what motivates us to achieve, it propels us forward to ask for what we want, and um, in many cultures, especially here in the West, men are rewarded for showing agency, which is assertiveness, making the first move, uh, ask, asking for what they want. Um, and whereas those same behaviors in women may be cast in a different light. However, what we saw when we spoke to the women we interviewed was that they all had this sort of inevitable, this um, sort of ineffable quality. And as we broke it down, it really, we looked at a number of, of characteristics. So one was, this idea of clarity of direction. Um, the women that we spoke to had a deep sense of intention, deep sense of their personal values, um, and they knew where they wanted to go. They had a, a very much a, a North Star. They had a sense of, yep, oh, sorry, yep, we'll go back one slide, thank you. Um, planful action. So, Women with agency don't sit around and wait for, to be called off the bench. They, they have a plan and they're consistently advocating for themselves 
to go to go for it. Um, taking calculated risks is incredibly key. So do you push yourself out of your comfort zone or do you wait to feel 100% sure that you can do the job before you go? And there's some really interesting research that um, uh, uh, covered in the uh, Harvard Business Review where in general, women tend to wait until they have 100% of the qualifications to go for a job versus, uh, versus men. Um, but women who are skilled at acting with agency take calculated risks. So self-awareness, incredibly important. These women know themselves really, really well. And to a woman, of, of all the women we spoke to, they really knew, they knew what their choices and their trade-offs would be, and they were prepared to, to act on that. Um, adaptability to changing circumstances. There's more than one way to get the job done. There's more than one way to pursue the goal. And resilience, and we're gonna come back to this thing because this is really important. The women that we spoke to were deeply resilient. They were able to bounce back quickly from their setbacks. And this is what really made them able to continue to rise further in their careers is because the reality is, is the more you achieve, the more you're going to fail. And so they knew, and they knew that and they accepted that reality. They were continuous learners. And then they're also very importantly, they were focused on controlling the things they could control and letting the, the, go of those things that were not within their control. So really just as a, uh, this is kind of a characteristic when we talk about agency, what we mean. So let's talk about what gets in the way of agency. Um, discomfort with authority. One of my favorite conversations with, with Deb, she's the CEO of a novelty. Uh, you'll get to meet her if you, when you purchase the book, when you read the book, but she's CEO of a novelty uh, toy company. And she said something that really stuck with me, which is it takes a while to be able to wear that, the mantle of leadership when you know that the buck stops with you and you have to get comfortable with that and grow into it. And I really liked that because oftentimes we, think, we find, especially earlier in our careers, that somehow we're automatically comfortable with being in charge when in reality, it's a process, right? From CCL's point of view, we talk about leadership as an iterative process that, that no one wakes up one morning just feeling like secure about being a leader and that that confidence comes from being tested and from failure and success. And so this is why it's important to continue to have lots of, of, of challenging assignments. Um, dysfunctional work environments, we, we all have experienced them and this is a key area that's one of the things that holds women back. Uh, we um, met a woman who was a uh, HR executive, now runs her own uh, HR consultancy and early in her career when, as, as a mid-level leader, uh, she was in an incredibly dysfunctional culture that made it hard for her to uh, be successful. She eventually left, she saw a lot of unethical behavior, um, a lot of favoritism, and she ended up leaving and starting her own consultancy and is now incredibly successful in Silicon Valley. Um, and then finally, last two really around um, lack of self-clarity. And we'll, we revisit this theme over and over, which is the North Star is what do you value what are your intentions and how do you decide what your choices and trade-offs will be? And, and those are the, if having that, if not having the clarity um, leads to um, uh, lack of agency. And then finally, this idea of outdated mental models. Um, mental models are those deeply ingrained assumptions and generalizations that influence how we understand the world and how we, and what action we take in response to it. And sometimes our mental models are outdated because they filter what we pay attention to um, and they can hold us back from opportunities because uh, that we should take because they keep us from seeing what's possible. And so, and, and throughout the book, we talk about how to re rethink those mental models, how to reset so that you can focus on the things that matter most to you. So let's talk about success. And this was a really interesting, um, whenever we're asked what are some of the big ahas or surprises uh, in, in writing this book and interviewing the uh, 50 plus women that we spoke to, one of the things that I always say is, is that um, the biggest surprise, at least to me, Jennifer, maybe, yeah. you'll, maybe you'll think differently, is these incredibly successful executives we met didn't have a plan. And I couldn't. Many of them did. They, many yeah, of them did yeah. not have a plan. They did not plan to be the CEOs no. or in, in the roles that they were in. And instead, they they what they had was rather than mapping their every move, we saw that they um, they thought about optimizing for learning. 
they thought about mm-hmm. optimizing their careers for the kinds of people that they could that they wanted to be exposed to. Um, we heard a lot. I wanted to get into a position where I could learn, have the most impact, and add the most value with my skill set. You know, and so these are smart, ambitious. Uh, uh, mm-hmm. high achieving people, people. Um, they had clearly defined values and priorities that guided their decisions about their career and life choices. And I'm wondering if any of this resonates for any of you listening to my voice. Um, these women were very consistent, and the men we spoke to as well, in their living their values and priorities, but they were flexible in how they were executed in their daily lives. When something didn't work or there was a better opportunity, they just, they went for that. Um, they didn't hesitate to make a change. They understood their choices and trade-offs um, for career and life and then proactively managed those choices to optimize their decisions. They had strong mentors and sponsors who could provide crucial guidance. We're gonna talk a little bit about that because that is a linchpin. Uh, and they were prepared to reinvent their careers when necessary to better align with their values, their concepts of themselves and their current priorities. And then the final thing, which I loved and we revisited quite a bit was they didn't over-personalize their failure and they understood failure, what we call in the book, glorious failure. Um, And we have to thank our- As painful as it is, As painful it it is, we need it. Um, But they understood failure as an opportunity to learn and grow rather than a personal deficit. And so let's talk a little bit about reinvention and um, and not and the women that we spoke to. And we spoke to a number of women who made fairly radical shifts in their careers, but they weren't afraid to do it. And the lessons that we learned from them were sort of summarized as this. So one was recognizing the needs, the signs when your current job is no longer meeting your needs. Now, sometimes you can change roles or change companies within if you're in a larger company and Mm -hmm. and that will help you fulfill your intentions and uh and where you would like to go but oftentimes it requires a harder reset Um, and so the women that we spoke to who made these career changes um also made time to explore outside interests i think of a susan who was a chief uh communications officer for a large industrial company And over the course of two to three years, she knew she wanted to make a move. And so she started very thoughtfully building relationships, building networks outside of the company to lay the tracks for her next move. Um, We also uh, talked to uh, another woman who started what we call the the side hustle, right? Mm -hmm. So oftentimes you can't, you know you want to make a, a move, but you can't afford to just quit your job and jump to the next thing. And so it's it's good to try what try what you want to do on the side. See if you actually enjoy doing it. Explore hobbies. Explore passions. Um, and then finally, and most importantly, is having a group of advisors. And again, the sponsors and mentors is what becomes really Im- important. Um, when Kaylin, who was who uh, who was a corporate attorney and now a very successful entrepreneur decided to make the move from being a corporate attorney to starting her own business, she consulted with a number of, of friends and said, should I be doing this? And and um, and one of her friends said to her, leap and the net will appear. And another friend said to her, if you don't make this move now, you'll never know. And she kept those group of friends and supporters around her while she tried out a number of different things. And as you'll read in the book, the first couple of things she tried, moves she tried weren't exactly it. And then she landed in her current role, which is entrepreneur of her own um, accessories mm-hmm. and desk, uh, desk accessory company and is now really successful. So, so we're gonna move into talking about um, your, um, your network of champions. And I've seen some of the uh, chats come up that actually relate to this. So there was a, a question that came up about women supporting other women. There's one around uh, men and uh, men being sponsors for women and people of color. Uh, uh, men who are, are thinking about, um, you know, the role of women. So, so this is, that's exactly, um, you know, where we want to go right now. Um, none of us succeed on our own. Um, in work, in life, in relationships, we don't succeed on our own. We're doing everything with other people for the most part. There may be that one person out there, uh, but we usually uh, go through life in, with the support 
or the influence in some way, whether it's positive or negative, of other people. So that influence comes in the form of either power, someone holds power over you, position, expertise, they hold the rewards, the punishment, or through relationships, some social capital, information flow. Both of those can have both positive and negative influence on you. And so what we want to do is to um, help you think about the kind of network you have around you and how to access that network. So networks tend to be what we call operational, personal, or strategic. There might be a little bit of overlap in, in the members of those networks, but generally operational networks uh, help you manage the responsibilities that are internal to your current role, your, your organization currently. Personal networks support you in your development. And strategic networks focus you on potential new opportunities and provide you with access to key stakeholders that you'll need to pursue them. If you, if you are to go through an exercise of mapping your stakeholders, um, which we encourage you to do, then you will get a sense of whether you've got a good balance of operational, personal, and strategic network members and, and how they're supporting you and how to access them. In that network, we hear the language around mentorship and sponsorship. And we hear that women are over-mentored and under-sponsored. Um, you need to have a mentor. Well, that's true. Mentors really can help us very much with both the operational and the personal um, aspects of networks. Sometimes they can help us with the strategic as well. The sponsors can help us particularly with the, with the strategic. So uh, while mentors um, help us in our current roles, they don't always open the doors for us. Uh, sponsors play that additional role of advocating for developing leaders. They recommend that up-and-coming leaders take on challenging assignments, or they provide and they actually might recommend those opportunities. Rosalie, one of the people we interviewed, uh, was, uh, had a particular sponsor early in her career. She, was, uh, she is now a university president and really aspired to be that. Um, but earlier in her career, she thought the path was directly straightforward, straight from one role to the other. Her sponsor said, no, you need to step outside of that direct path, go get some other experiences that give you exposure to other networks that will be important when you are a president, but you won't gain them uh, before you come to be a president at this university. So she, she was really guided and very grateful for the influence of, of that particular sponsor. So you need to think about those people in your network and, and how to engage them as mentors, as sponsors, and how they, how they play the different roles in your network. Back to you, Portia. So Jennifer and I are both executive coaches, and uh, we, we saw an interesting phenomenon when we were thinking about what we were going to write about. And one of the things that we noticed was that we were working with these incredible, yeah. high-achieving women who oftentimes were their own worst critics. And I will tell you, I, I put myself in that category mm -hmm. because, because, and feeling like I was not qualified for, or, or that people didn't think I would be qualified for the role that I was in. And I doubly had those, had those feelings as a woman of color because often, and in fact, through most of my career, I've often been the only African-American woman mm -hmm. where I've worked. And so I always felt like I had to work harder. I was the spotlight was on me that I was going, and that if I failed, it was going to be catastrophic. And it was only years later when I became an executive coach that I realized that this phenomenon of feeling like a phony, of feeling like the whole world was going to collapse in on me was actually had a name. Right. Who, who, right. who, who knew? knew? <laughs> who knew? Who knew? And it's called the imposter syndrome. And it was actually, uh, it's a term that was coined by Pauline Rose Clance and Susan Imes Clance in 1978 called the imposter phenomenon, and it is simply described as when it's a, a su successful and an intelligent people, professionals don't feel like the des they deserve their accomplishments and that they have faked their way to success. And if you've ever felt like this, you know that feeling of like, oh my God, at some point the, the game's going to be up or they're going to find out that I'm a big phony. And um, since its introduction, the imposter syndrome has been well researched and documented and the thing is, is that people who suffer from the imposter syndrome experience negative stress, fear, anxiety, um, and lose confidence, can be adverse to taking risks. So 
in all, it's not a recipe for a, a successful career. And so we had seen this phenomenon so much in the, um, in the women that we coach that we really wanted to write about it. Um, I also have done a TED Talk um, about it as well. And so, and the question that always comes up is, okay, well, once I know that I'm experiencing this, what do I do about it? And so the, we, ha we have come up with just a few short um, ways to begin to address. And the first is, is, is to focus on the facts. Um, one of the things that we know about the individuals who experience the imposter syndrome is, is that they often objectively deny the success that they've had. And so when we say, sit down and take a look at your last three performance reviews, take a look at your resume and what you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. you know, and we ask the question, do you dismiss your achievements as dumb luck or a result of external forces? Are you able to claim your successes? Um, and in the book, we have a um, and on the website, I believe, a personal success in right. an mm -hmm. inventory that can help you or maybe someone you're coaching discover the strengths and, ex and to claim that success. Um, a second really important thing is around challenging limiting beliefs. So, and a limiting belief sounds like this. Um, that, one, that company has never had a black woman mm -hmm. as, as a senior vice president. Mm -hmm. um, I'll never make it. By the way, that was one of my, that was one of my limiting beliefs and I was able to overcome that. Um, or that, or I'm the first person. I'm the first person in my family to um, have gone to college. Right. I could never get much much further from that. That's a that's a limited, limiting belief. And so what we 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 challenge in our coaching engagements is to challenge those limiting beliefs to say, hey, you know what? Maybe is there a strength there that you're not acknowledging? The fact that you're the first in your in your family to go to college maybe shows you're really scrappy, right? right. right. Um, claiming your strengths, we ask people to think about what are those rather than being their own worst critic, to really embrace what they do well and what they do better than anyone else. And then finally, and most importantly, just realizing that we're, that we're not alone. Those of us who've experienced right. it and talking about it, don't let it be bottled up inside. Well, lots of times when you talk about it, it makes other people realize, oh, that's what's going on for me. That's too. exactly not right. That I don't expect it of myself. It's that I'm limiting myself through that, that imposter syndrome. So fitness. When, when Jennifer and I, we wrestled with this a lot. In fact, we even d debated whether we should talk about fitness at all because I don't, as a woman, I feel like I'm a personal, I'm a professional dieter sometimes at any, <laughs> at any point in my life. And what we realized was, was that we didn't want to write sort of the typical eat right and exercise chapter, but we wanted to talk about energy management and how do you manage your energy to optimize your performance? And so the focus of the chapter that we write is really on that. And the thing is, is that there's a lot of things working against women in terms of being able to do that right. well, right? So in the 2017 Women in the Workplace report by Lena.org and McKinsey, confirms that women are still doing the lion's share of housework. And this maybe resonates with you. And the report found that 54% of women say that they do all or most of the household duties compared to only 22% of men. And so, and this gap grows when couples have children. And so we looked at that. We also looked at the, so there's the issue of the housework. We also looked at the fact that sleep is, is that, and if, if particularly if you are in the United States, but around the world, we are sleep, women especially are mm -hmm. sleep deprived. And sleep we know is one of the most important things for optimal energy management. And so in general, the sleep, uh, the National Sleep Foundation suggests that we get somewhere between eight and nine hours of sleep. Most adults are getting somewhere between six to seven hours of sleep on average. And so we, we talk about sleep as being one of, the, it, it is your superpower. It is the magic bullet is one of the things that really helps um, advance. And so with, and then of course, with all of this demand also, women are also struggling to find the time to exercise. And so, but what we see is that in CCL's research, regardless of actual fitness level, women who are this, now this is interesting, perceived to be more active are more positive, positively evaluated by others in 360 assessments than those who are not perceived to be active. Maybe it's that they are perceived to have more energy, be more organized or, or whatever. And so the women that we spoke to when we talk about energy management had found a way to carve out time during their week, as busy as they were. Some of them were caring for young children. Some of them were caring for uh, aging parents. Some of them just, just were just busy executives. They carved out time. They carved out time to exercise 
get the sleep they needed, and they found ways of eating that worked with their, uh, with their bodies, and we explore that in depth in the book. So those bars, uh, you guys have pointed out accurately, sorry about that, but the bars are not labeled. What Portia just talked about refers to the bars, so the blue and the green. So um, you, can, you can see that, the, um, that there's a difference um, in, in um, perception of, of uh, whether you have energy or dependability or organization if you are perceived to exercise. So that's the difference there. It's, it's reflecting what Portia just spoke about in terms of perceptions of fitness and how it's related to perceptions of your leadership capabilities. Good questions. By the way, we are, we are watching the chat. We are uh, gonna take a lot of these questions at the um, end and probably won't get to all of them because you guys have great questions. There's a lot uh, of great questions here. And um, we want to get through our through the, the, the next, the last three chapters quickly, and then we'll uh, come back to the, some of the questions. Yeah, so the equation around energy management really is about um, exercise, about, and let's call it, or movement, if you will, if exercise is not a word you like in your vocabulary, but it really is about exercise. It's about nutrition. Uh, it's about sleep, and I can't say it enough again. Sleep, sleep, Sleep. Sleep is your friend, and it's one of the most important things um, for energy management. And then it's about resiliency and building in. The one thing I just want to share, Jennifer, before I flip it over yeah. to you is, is that, that what one really interesting thing we learned from all of the women that we spoke to is they all had some kind of spiritual practice. They might write in, their, write in a journal every morning. Some of them attended church. Others made a point to go out and hike. Um, mm -hmm. be, be alone in nature once a week, but they all had something they did just for themselves every week right. in order to restore Whatever their energy. Whatever it was that fit their balance, right? Now, we just talked about um, some of the things that get in the way for women of being fit, of being active, and some of that also uh, gets in the way of continuing a career. So let's think about the main points where uh, a woman may, may leave the workforce oftentimes it's when you're at the point of having children and having to make that decision about do I um, give my children my full attention, do I give my job my full attention, do I divide it in some way, and um, the, the truth of the matter is workplaces don't make it easy for, for women to make those decisions. So uh, we, we learned through research and in the conversations that we had with women that certainly Leave policies get in the way, so a lot of countries and organizations provide minimal leave and little flexibility. Faced with that hardship, if I have to face that, that hardship, I'm just going to leave the workforce. Uh, some women asked whether their job would still be there for them. So although it's illegal to, uh, for, for an organization to uh, take a job away from a woman when she leaves the workforce temporarily to have children, uh, sometimes it happens. So people uh, sometimes question whether the job will be back when I come back from a six week or a three month or a one year leave, whatever it may be. Reputational loss um, is, a, is, is something that we heard as well. So there's a, something called a motherhood penalty where research shows that, uh, that, that working women, working men, uh, and uh, uh, men and women who are working and parents are judged differently. And the bottom line is that of all of those categories, working mothers were judged the most harshly. Um, one of the women we interviewed is now retired, but she felt that pressure to get back at work after her children were born because she was the only pregnant person ever in that role. <laughs> and so, you know, to be judged by being out for six weeks and her performance being judged that way was giving her heartburn about, uh, about reputational loss. And then finally, impact on future earnings. There is uh, absolutely no doubt that, um, that when, when women have children and leave the workforce for some period of time, uh, they will never catch up to where their earnings could be. Now again, if you go back to our first chapter, what your values are, that may be fine. That may, be, may not be an issue for you, but you need to just think through what's important. And so we talked in the book about keys to powering down, not dropping out of the workforce, but just powering down. How can you maintain your competitive edge while you're out for a while? Do you, are you staying connected with, uh, with the professional associations in your area of practice? 
Can you uh, uh, translate the caregiving role, the home care role that you are uh, demonstrating into what that translates into in the workforce? Um, keeping your network intact. Stay in touch with those people that you are associated with who are in your network. Let them keep your brain active and, and keep, them, keep yourself on their minds as you are taking a time out from the workforce. Stay mentally sharp. Again, that may be reading, it may be going to the conferences, but keep your, keep your brain mentally in, in the work that you do. And then if you can, and creatively outsource low value activities. So what does that mean? Well, what can someone else do? Can someone else clean your house? And so that you can do something else that's important for your family or, or, or get yourself to a conference. If you can't pay someone to clean your house, maybe you can trade that job with someone who's a friend who's staying home as well and, and, can, uh, and you do something else for her. So think of ways to power, to power down without fully dropping out. Now, just when we're saying, here's all these things that you need to do, you also need to have work-life balance. How about that? <laughs> what is that thing? Well, really, uh, first of all, uh, balance is a, is a misnomer. We really mean harmony. Some of our colleagues have done some great research around this. And, um, and what they find is that really it's about knowing that uh, you can get the important work done, the important things to, to your life, whether it's work, family, community, personal, you, can, you have time and space to pay attention to those things. Um, and so one of the, uh, the tools uh, that we built was uh, something called a work-life indicator. And um, it, it's available on uh, CCL's website. Uh, if you go to our website, it's a self-assessment, really quick and easy, uh, very inexpensive. And it gives you a sense of what's, what, what works for you and how you, your current situation is helping you manage that. Uh, it also gives strategies. Some of the people we talked with said, you know, I start my day really early so that I can get some things out of the way and done before other people start to come into the office. Or I engage others. I need to get help in order to get everything done. I need to be flexible. Josephine shared that her uh, family meal time was important, but it was rare that they could all be together for one meal a week. And so they had to be a little bit more flexible about that and say, well, it's not gonna be every Friday night per se, but if, if, it, if three of the four of us can have dinner together one night a week, then we'll be happy. And integrate. The tool does a really great job of helping you understand if integration works for you. So that means do you like to keep your work and your personal life completely separate or do you like to bring them together in a way that works for you? That's another strategy that can be used. I'm not gonna go through these different uh, styles right here, but uh, these are the preferences that you would see if you were, if you took the work-life indicator. I know I'm an integrator. Um, I am and, too. And sometimes, you know, that's not appreciated by other people in my life who shall remain nameless, but um, I'm also integrating my family stuff at work as well. So that's what works for me, and I feel balanced. I feel harmonized when I can integrate well. Portia, tell us about executive presence. So we spend a lot of time in our women's leadership, in, in the uh, women's program talking about executive presence. This is one of our favorite books by Sylvia mm -hmm. Ann Hewlett, who um, interviewed nearly 300 executives. And I, I, we love this definition of, of, of executive presence, which is made up of three attributes, gravitas, appearance, and communications. And of the three, the most important is gravitas. And I want to just talk, talk about that very briefly, which is it's um, a leader, in fact, when one of our, who was interviewed by one of our in interviewees, stood out for her fearlessness. She would go into anyone's office, and she was, and this individual told us, she would go into anyone's office, office and would tell them what they needed to hear. She'd earned a reputation for being straightforward, saying what needed to be said. Um, and, you know, when you exude gravitas, people will listen. Your ideas are taken seriously and your power to influence expand, expands. And so we love this idea of, of, of gravitas. And then, the, um, and then communications, um, there's an emerging finding from CCL research study that indicates that men and women entrepreneurs are judged differently in the pacing and pausing of their speech when they're making pitches for venture capital funding. Think about that for a second. Yeah. For men, their pace and the ratio of pausing to talking had no impact, no impact 
on whether they received venture funding. But for women, when they the faster they spoke and the fewer pauses they used, the more likely they were to get venture capital funding. Um, and so we talk a lot in the book about communication and what that looks like. And we won't touch on appearance here. Um, we, in fact, we de we debated hotly whether we should talk about appearance <laughs> we really at all. Didn't want to. <laughs> we did not want to talk about appearance. And the thing I will say though is that we also recognize that. Unfortunately, women especially mm -hmm. are judged for how they look. And so we touch on that topic um, in a way that we hope is thoughtful. Uh, but we would love if for those of you who have the book, check that chapter yeah. out and tell us what you think. And so and we may make some changes in the next edition. <laughs> and then finally, um, you know, we live in this hyper curated world now. And whether you are prof you're a professional who works in a corporate setting or you're an entrepreneur and you're a team of one or two, uh, we live with social media. Mm -hmm. And your brand extends now from real life into social media. And so we do spend a lot of time talk thinking and talking about how to craft your social media persona, if you will. Bottom line is it should be you. It should be real and it right. should be authentic. Um, if you've not audited your brand online, you should do that. You, you look at your LinkedIn pages. Uh, we know lots of people who have gotten burned by Facebook. Pay, Facebook, you know, <laughs> there is no such thing as what's pri of, of private now. It's like having a chlorinated and non-chlorinated side of the pool. It's all <laughs> out there for everyone to see. And so we encourage the professionals that we work with to really think about the, how they're showing up online. And, um, and you'll see here, I won't read it to you, but this is my brand statement. And it's something that I try to live every day and it's how I want to show up. And we encourage um, the women that we work with and le leaders that we work with to think about what do you want people to say about you when you're not in the room? And then how do you end that? And, and how do you live that? Okay. So in our last chapter, and we referenced this right at the beginning, uh, part of this needs to start, we showed the pipeline where uh, we start at entry level, but really the pipeline of women in leadership starts when girls are young. And I've got some data up here on the screen, not going to read it all to you. Uh, you'll get these slides. But the point is that, that girls begin to uh, not envision themselves as leaders and therefore not take on leadership roles in schools and so forth as early as fourth grade. We have to do something about that, and that's all of us. And so we talk in the book about some of the things, some of the barriers that get in the way. So who was told you're bossy? I was. I was too. Yeah. I'm, still, I'm still probably bossy. But maybe but I, we're but, okay with but, it. But we're I'm totally right. fine with it, Jennifer. Right. <laughs> or, or seeing, um, you know, I can't do that. There are expectations that come up around um, uh, whether girls think that they can be really, really smart, whereas boys think they can be really, really smart. There's a self-doubt that starts to come in around that fourth or fifth grade uh, age. They don't, um, they don't know where they can practice leadership. So we have to make sure that we're providing opportunities, Girl Scouts, Girls Who Code, um, clubs in schools, mentorships for girls. We've got to make sure we're providing some of that. And then role models are really important. So are girls seeing the kind of person that they can emulate? Are they seeing someone like them when they are younger? Are they seeing them in leadership roles? Are they, yes, they might be teachers, but are they also principals? And so how can we help to show girls those kinds of role models that they need to have? So we give a lot of ideas about that as well. Okay, so we have shared the content of the book in a very fast, high level. Um, and, um, and we've seen a lot of the, the, the questions, questions going by here, wonderful mm -hmm. questions. Um, we've got, um, you're going to get as follow-up resources. You'll get the slides and the recording that we've made. And you'll get links to some resources. Some of you have been asking about some of the resources. Some of them are showing up in the chat, uh, but if not, they'll be on uh, what we are, what you'll, what you'll get, uh, the links that you'll get uh, tomorrow. And so now what we'd like to do is um, open it up for questions. And we're just going to keep our, our, uh, our handles here and um, for a little bit so you can uh, capture those. And then we're going to show you the website link in a moment too. But um, in terms of questions, um, Regina or Tracy, are you going to give yeah. us some questions there? I do have some questions here. Um, we did receive a lot of great ones. We'll try to get to many as we can. Um, if there are organizations and cultural practices that are unintentionally at play, what is the best way to advocate for yourself? <laughs> yeah, in three minutes. Um, 
so so if you are so let's let's say I'm speaking to someone who's is a mid career mid level in an organization. One of the best ways to advocate for yourself is to find a starting place. So is that starting place your manager? Is it someone more senior to you who's not your manager who might be able to act as a sponsor and who can help to guide you through some of the barriers that you might be encountering? Um, that's only about you. Really what has to happen then, and this takes time, is for an organization to begin to systemically address some of those issues. Many organizations have employee resource groups, which is a great way uh, to address some of those issues and um, policies and so forth. So, but you as a, an individual are not expected to take all of that on. However, if you have access to those in your organization, it's a great place to access. Thank you. Um, Trudy asked, did you find in your, um, that women in leadership had to sacrifice some of their feminine characteristics, um, examples empathy or understanding to achieve success? It's such an interesting question and, you know, obviously we can't generalize to everyone, but I will just say I think the women that we spoke to um, and I think from our research um, were very much authentically themselves, mm -hmm. right? And so they did not, and we asked those kinds of questions, did you, have to leave any part of yourself behind as a woman in order to succeed. And they were to a woman adamant that if they felt that pressure, they moved on because they wanted to bring their full person, who they right. authentically were to, the, uh, uh, to their work. And most of them felt that being a woman was a tremendous, uh, mm -hmm. a tremendous asset. They actually talked about their children. They right. talked about um, uh, their home life because they felt it made them more accessible and uh, and more approachable in their work. And the empathy that, yes. that they were able to authentically demonstrate made them stronger leaders in their view than if they had not accessed that empathy. Absolutely. Yeah. I can give you many examples of where we saw that. Yeah. Uh, one question. more? From, yeah, one more question. Um, uh, how do women with diversity, color, disability, et cetera, rise in leadership? Mm -hmm. Oh, goodness. Well, women, we'll both take this. Women yeah. with diversity are going to face all of these challenges and more. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, part of the issue is um, with all women, uh, it's, it's not something that, that is your fault. It's not your doing. You are not, um, we are, you know, it's not about fixing you. It's about being able to get your organization to support and help you move ahead, providing those kinds of um, resources and so some of what we've shared is a way of going about it um, but um, go ahead. Yes, yeah, so so this is Portia. So as an African-American woman, I, I definitely have experienced this. I have found that um, and and I learned this real, I'll just be very candid, I learned this late mm -hmm. that having a sponsor made all yeah. of the difference yeah. um, and my sponsors were of, um, I had male sponsors, I had many male sponsors, I had a number of women sponsors but that made the difference for me. Um, I just otherwise I would have gotten I would have gotten lost. Um, I do think um, working for companies, organizations that value diversity. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I know at Ingersoll at Ingersoll Rand, where it's something that is very much ingrained in the values, and there we and and from a leadership standpoint, this is the thing that I look at is in making choices about where I work. Is mm -hmm. is this something that is diversity? Um, whether you are a woman of color, if you're a person of different ability, is it something that is actually valued and, and acted upon in the company? Right. That makes all the difference uh, as well. But I would just say on a very personal level that sponsorship makes all the difference. And if you want advice on how to do that, the person who asked that, please, you can ping me privately and I'll be happy to connect with you. Well, thank you, Jennifer and Portia, for sharing your strategies for advancing women that can be applied personally or as a mentor, sponsor, or women's initiative leader. Uh, this will conclude our program for today. Be on the lookout for a follow-up email tomorrow, which will include links to the webinar recording and our women's leadership resources. We hope you've enjoyed the session and will join us again for a future webinar. We will stay online for a few more minutes, so if you have any additional questions for our presenters, feel free to send them into the chat box. As you exit the webinar, we hope you'll take a moment to complete the evaluation so we can continue to make these events well worth your time. Anyone who completes the evaluation will also be entered into a drawing for the copy of the Kick Some Glass publication. You can also request that a CCL team member follow up with you. 
Again, thank you, Jennifer and Portia, and to our audience. Thank you all. Thanks, everybody. This concludes today's webcast. Thank you all for attending. We will send all registrants an email tomorrow with a link to the recording. And please don't forget, visit our webinar event calendar at www.ccl.org. Thank you.